please join me in welcoming Dr. Amir Alexander. Really delighted to be here and, uh, you know, would have been even better in person, but that's the world we live in and this is, this is great too. So thank you. And thanks also, also to for Tom, Tom Holland, for, for making this web connection possible. So I appreciate that. Yes, so the topic for today is how mathematics shapes our world and, uh, and, our, and our values. And uh, I would like to, uh, to begin simply, uh, simply uh, with a story. Uh, this man here, as uh, you might be able to see, uh, his name is Carl Gustav Jacobi. And he was a very prominent uh, mathematician in the 19th century. He was, he was German. And in 1842, uh, Jacobi was invited to speak before the British Association for the Advancement of Science that was meeting in the city of Manchester. And uh, Jacobi, Jacobi went over there and he gave, he gave his speech. And when he, when he came back, he was very proud of himself. And he wrote to his brother, he wrote and also to a fellow mathematician, French mathematician, Legendre. And he wrote to them that, uh, that I, I stood there before my uh, English colleagues and I told them that, here it is, the glory of science is to be of no use. And in particular, the glory of mathematics is to be of no use. Um, now, to be honest, uh, Jacobi didn't make a lot of converts that day. Uh, Manchester at the time looked something like this. Uh, this is, it was the hub of manufacturing in England where, uh, where English scientists were harnessing all their, all their knowledge and all their skill in order to, uh, to promote and improve and create a industrial uh, sort of, this was the industrial revolution, what we call, uh, what we call today. And this notion that science and mathematics are of no use seemed kind of rather ridiculous to people who spend their time trying to improve the performance of steam engines and spinning jennies and, 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 and all such things. Uh, and here comes this German and says, oh, the glory of science and of mathematics is to be, is to be of no use. So in Manchester, it was not a popular message. And obviously, uh, Jacobi knew that, which is why he was so proud of, of provoking his guests. But while the English, his English hosts might not have been impressed, uh, among mathematicians, uh, he, this was not an unusual, an unusual uh, uh, position. Uh, because uh, many mathematicians then, as well as, as, well as now, uh, believe that mathematics is indeed just a matter, it is indeed, it's not, it's not to be judged by its practical application or by its impact on the world, but just on its own, as the mathematician G.H. Hardy put it, uh, mathematics is to be valued as art, if it is to be valued at all. Uh, but if that is indeed the case, if Jacobi was right, if Hardy was right, why does mathematics matter? Why do we care? Why, why should we care uh, about mathematics? I mean, perhaps if we're advanced mathematician, we can say, oh, this is so beautiful and be excited about that. Uh, but beside that very elite circle of professional mathematicians, you can wonder, well, why, why should we really care about mathematics if it doesn't really shape or impact our world? Well, one answer is obvious. Mathematics does impact the world through technology, very obviously, uh, through science and our knowledge of the world. So you have, uh, uh, you know, in, like in those uh, basic uh, 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 physical formulas, uh, the calculus and mathematics may, uh, do everything. They make flames fly. They make our, our cell phone works. They, they, uh, they, you need mathematics in order to send uh, rovers to rovers to Mars in order to build skyscrapers. So clearly mathematics does have a very, uh, certain kinds of mathematics at least, have a very practical side. They enable us to do things in the world and some of them are very amazing things, in fact. But that doesn't really solve the entire problem because it's really a pretty small, pretty small little corner of mathematics 
that has those applications. Hardy also commented on that in his in his book, uh, An Apology of a Mathematician. He said, yes, there are things that are practical about mathematics. That's the boring part of mathematics. We don't care. We don't care uh, about those. Uh, and the truth is that for the most part, uh, a great deal of math, perhaps most of advanced math, uh, is, is useless. Uh, that is, uh, if you think about it, um, like uh, 2,000, more than 2,000 years ago, Archimedes found all those ways to calculate the area of the parabola, inside a parabola. How many people ever use that? Or more modern, like uh, Cantor's transfinites, his, his categorization of different types of, of different magnitude, so to speak, of infinite. What is that really good for? Or even more modernly, like the Langlands program, the frontiers of modern mathematics. I don't think anybody knows what practical application that can possibly have. So for the most part, you can certainly say that most of mathematics is really just to be judged for its beauty. Its glory is to be of no, of no use at all. But what I, the argument that I want to make today is that mathematics does matter. That it is, mathematics is important, and it does shape our world in very, very profound ways. And that is not just as what we see here as a toolkit, uh, as a toolkit for, uh, for technology, even though there's no question that that is, that is extremely important as well. The way mathematics impacts our world that I want to talk about today is because of this. Mathematics is the science of order. That is, mathematics is, as we understand it, it is the deepest order in, in the universe. It is the truth about the universe and the relationship between the truth of the universe that is absolutely true and absolutely irrevocable and absolutely and universal and fundamental and unchanging. It is the deepest order of the universe. And it turns out that what we think about this deep order of the universe or how we see this deep order of the universe can have very profound ways of how we understand the world and how we shape our world, not just the physical world, but our own human, uh, uh, political, social, ideological world. Our values, our beliefs are also shaped by the way that we understand mathematics, okay? So that's the argument I want to make today. And uh, I, uh, I brought along, I brought uh, uh, three different examples here that I would like to talk about. The first one in greatest detail related to two others uh, a little less. Uh, I'm not entirely sure we'll be able to get to, we'll be able to get to everything, but uh, you know, let's start out and, and see how far we go. And then perhaps we'll have some time to talk about it. So I'd like to begin with a story here. And this is a story, a very sad story that took place in the uh, uh, in 1661. And it was on August 17, 1661, that King Louis XIV, who you see on the left here, he was a young king, 23 years old, he was flush with ambition. He had just declared that he was going to rule the uh, he was going to rule the kingdom by himself without any minister to take care of things. And he arrives at the chateau of his uh, uh, chief of finances by the name, a man by the name of Nicolas Fouquet, who you see at the right. Fouquet had built a beautiful new chateau called Volevico. There it is. And you have to admit it is beautiful and uh, it's very much worth the visit. And Fouquet welcomes the king as he descends from his, from his carriage. He guides him inside. Into, uh, uh, into the chateau that is on the far side from what you see in this picture. He guides it in, he shows him the beautiful uh, uh, cupola that, uh, uh, and the paintings by, uh, uh, by Le Brun and Le Vaux. Uh, and then he leads him out, and then he leads him out uh, to the garden, to show him the garden uh, that was created by his, uh, his favorite gardener, André Le Nôtre. And uh, he leads the king and his retinue. He goes down from the chateau, down the uh, down that central uh, uh, down that central alley. Here we go. Here we go. This is how this is how it looks. Coming down from the 
Chateau. He goes down that central avenue between those two parterres. They're called parterres de la broderie because they're like embroideries uh, to the circular, to this uh, uh, circular pond uh, surrounded by two rectangular pond. He continues along between uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two the tritons, uh, pools on either side further down, leading to uh, a mirror pool, the square one, uh, the square one in the distance, and uh, and finally to the uh, semicircular grotto at the very end, where the, they're all seated, the king and his retinue and their host, and uh, and watch and enjoy the new comedy by Molière. After the comedy, they go back to the chateau. Uh, Fouquet serves a sumptuous a, a sumptuous meal to the, the, to the king and his and, and, and his, all his, all his retinue as well as five thousand household guards. Fireworks shoot, shoot out from the dome of the chateau and then descend on them like like midnight midnight suns. Uh, it is a very glorious it is a glorious uh, uh, entertainment, truly worthy of a king. And on the next on the next morning. Uh, the king is about is about to depart. He 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 goes back into his carriage. Uh, Fouquet, basking in the glow of royal approval, says his fa says his farewells, uh, and the king departs. But as they are on their way back to the royal chateau of Fontainebleau, the king turns to his mother, Anne of Austria, and he says to her. Ah, madame, should we not make these people disgorge all of that? And so the king was only 23 years old, but he was a man true to his word. And it was, uh, and so three weeks later, the king is in the city of Nantes. He summons his, uh, the, his uh, uh, director of finances, Fouquet, to meet, it, to meet him in the, in the city of Nantes. And during an interview in which he showers him, Praise and uh, uh, and, uh, and and comp and, and compliments. He gives a signal, and at the signal, the Comte d'Artagnan, the captain of musketeers, springs from behind behind the curtain and arrests Fouquet and takes him off and takes him off to jail. And Fouquet is now charged with embezzlement. Uh, Fouquet was lucky enough to escape with his life. His popularity uh, uh, sufficed at least to, to save him his life, but instead the king insists that he be locked up in a chateau in Pinerot in the Alps and spend the last 20 years of his life locked up, locked up in a chateau, in, 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 this, in this prison, uh, in this mountain prison. Uh, poor Fouquet. Glorious Fouquet never got to see his beautiful, his magnificent chateau of Bolivicum again. So the question is, what did what did Fouquet do? What was it that Fouquet did that so enraged the king? After all, the king was known to be merciful. He was merciful even to those who rose against him in this great uprising of the early uh, of the early decades of his reign, uh, called the. Uh, uh, the fond, uh, but for but somehow, for for uh, for Fouquet, who had known the king since childhood, had stood by him in all his trials and tribulations. For Fouquet, there would be no mercy. And why is that? Perhaps a clue is what happened at Vaudevicom after after uh, Fouquet was arrested, because while Fouquet was locked up. Uh, an army of, uh, of seemingly of scavenger descended on his beautiful chateau. They, uh, they, they toppled the statues, they packed them up, they pulled out, they pulled out the trees. Um, they, uh, 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 every little, everything that, uh, uh, every, everything that was at all movable or dislodgeable in this beautiful estate of Bolivicom, they took and packed up and packed up and sent away. But they were not robbers from the neighborhood these were the king's men and they took all those things all the uh, all the statuary and, and the trees and the bushes and everything including by the way uh, uh, the, the the architect the painter and the gardener of Volodicom and they took them all and they packed them all and they sent him to the king's new palace which was of course at Versailles 
Because in the end, it wasn't just, it wasn't uh, Fouquet's wealth or his perhaps grandiosity uh, that doomed him in the eyes of the king, or even the fact that he had a fleet of a uh, private fleet of mer armed merchantmen that, you know, kings might not look too kind kindly upon if that's a private possession. But it wasn't that. What ultimately doomed him was his garden. The garden, that garden that he led, that he led the king through on that night, that beautiful, symmetrical, symmetrical garden, because it was a geometrical garden. And a geometrical garden was something that the king believed no commoner should ever have. So why, why did a geometrical garden so perturb the greatest and most powerful king in Europe? So, so perturb him that he determined to lock up its owner. Well, to understand that, we need to go back. We need to go back and to understand what geometry is, what its significance is, and why it was so important to Louis XIV. There is Versailles, the 1700, uh, quite a few years after, uh, after the uh, despoliation of Vaux. So uh, sometime around the fifth century BCE, somebody, in, somebody in the, wrote the first proof. The first mathematical, the first mathematical proof. We don't know who that was. We don't know what that proof was. But we do know that that person was uh, Greek or Greek speaking, that he was somewhere in the Greek world or in the Greek cities that were not just in the mainland, but also dotted all the coasts of the Mediterranean from Asia Minor uh, and in North Africa all the way to, uh, all the way to, uh, uh, to Spain. Uh, the coasts were dotted with those uh, uh, with those uh, Greek cities, and somewhere in that Mediterranean world, somebody wrote that first proof. Now, the Greeks were not the only ancient civilization with a magnificent mathematical uh, uh, mathematical tradition. There were also the Babylonians, there were the Egyptians, there were Chinese. There, were the, uh, there was a magnificent tradition in India there, and the Maya in the New World, they all had magnificent mathematical traditions in their own right, but none of them, none of them ever thought of the idea, ever thought that they needed to prove anything. No, none of them came up with this idea of proof because proof is something radical. Proof is the notion that through our mind, through pure reasoning, we can reach truths that are absolutely certain, irrefutable, irrevocable, unchallengeable. No sane person could possibly deny that. That is, that is what a proof is. And we can reach that level of truth, not by divine revelation or in consulting the star, but simply by the power of reason. By the power of reason, we can reach absolute truth. That is a radical, that is a radical idea. Not just an idea, the fact that they went ahead and did it. It's a radical accomplishment. Uh, and the truth is that it was accomplished only once in, in human history, and that was that was the time when it when it was accomplished. And all the proofs of all of mathematics that we have since then are all descended, are all descendants of that discovery uh, in the Greek world in the fifth century uh, BC. Now, by 400 BC, uh, geometers were proving fairly sophisticated, uh, fairly sophisticated uh, uh, theorem. We know, we know some of them, and they are remarkably sophisticated and, and clever. Uh, uh, but they were also, they were sort of a, kind of a mishmash. That is, they were not, uh, the proofs were, uh, you know, different mathematicians made different assumptions and, they, and, proved, and proved different theorems, some of them here, some of, some of, some of them there. It was sort of, kind of, sort of a, a disconnected a uh, uh, set set of proof, impressive, impressive to be sure in their own right, but not really forming a, a, a solid single uh, body of knowledge. Uh, the person who put all those disparate pieces together and turned them into and turned them into the unified science of geometry was Euclid. 
Euclid of Alexandria, a man of whom we know very little, except that he lived around 300 BC, and uh, he was in the, and he worked in the in the library on the sorry the Museum of Alexandria, which is also a library and what we call research institute, uh, under the patronage of uh, King Ptolemy I. Um, uh, and that's really all we know about him apart from his works. And the greatest and the most famous and perhaps the most important mathematical work ever written, perhaps one of the most important works ever written, uh, Euclid's Elements. And what did, what did Euclid accomplish, accomplish in, the, uh, in the Elements? Well, he begins with a set of self-evident postulates. Or, or common notions, things we can all agree on. Nothing, nothing controversial, something that everybody with some minimal of, of reason would agree on. All right angle, here, here, here's a set of them from, from my edition, for example. Uh, all right angles are equal to one another. That's why things are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. Some things that are truly, truly uh, basic. And then, from these simple, irrefutable things that, that we all agree on, he said, okay, we agreed on this. Well, let's move a little forward. Let's see what we can deduce from this. And then step by step by step, he, he starts proving things that are not at all self-evident. For example, that the sun, sum of the angles of a triangle is always the same and is equal to two right angles or what we call 360 degrees. He proves that. That's not something that we just, come up with. That's not something that's obvious. No, that's, a, that, that's pretty, that's surprising, but it's true because he proved it based by, by, by rational deduction, careful rational deduction from these uh, original postulates. Uh, he proves that the sum of the squares of the legs of the right triangle is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, what we know as Pythagoras theorem. He proved that. Uh, again, that's pretty surprising. Not something that we would guess at just by looking at a triangle, but he proved it. And he proved it in a way that is absolutely certain about every single right triangle that ever was or ever will be. And that's, that's pretty impressive. And so on and so forth about, about, he, about circles and angles and straight lines and triangles and, and, and so on and so on and so forth. What he created, uh, from these from these initial initial assumptions uh, was essentially a mathematical world. That is a world composed of lines, of circles, of angles, of figures like triangles, and squares, and rectangles, and so on. A whole world in which every single item and every single and every every single item and every single claim was absolutely true and absolutely certain. And not, and not only that, but each one of them dependent on all the others. That is, he starts out with those simple postulates and then he, and then he, he comes up with a, a, the first level of, of, uh, of theorems, that is conclusions from those. And then, and then another layer of deductions from those, and then another layer of, de of deductions from those, stage upon stage upon stage. And in the end, you create an entire geometrical world, uh, which is absolutely certain. It is, absol it is perfect, it is certain, and it is rationally ordered, and it is also hierarchical. Because everything is descended ultimately step by step by step from those initial assumptions. Everything is true, everything is perfect, everything has its exact, irrevocable, unchangeable place in a great, necessary, rational hierarchy. It is a truly, truly uh, a perfect, eternal, unchanging world that Euclid, that Euclid created, uh, that Euclid created in the elements. Um, so, this is this. Uh, you compare this to the world that we live in. This is a world of fixed truth, irrevocable order, eternal hierarchy. Everything has its exact place, the correct place, the true place that belongs only to him or her 
or it. Uh, how do you compare that to our own transitory world in which things come and go and uh, everything is random, you know, every, you know, history is whatever everybody, anybody gets up in the morning and decides to do a total chaos and confusion. That's the world that we, that we live. Compare that to that perfect world of eternal hierarchical truth that Euclid created. So Euclid certainly had his, uh, uh, certainly had his admirers. Now, uh, as it happens, uh, the impact of uh, the, the, Im the impact of, of Euclid's, uh, Euclid's element was it was felt among geometers to be sure it was greatly also greatly admired by philosophers certainly Platonists who uh, 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 who were very very uh, always uh, uh, reveled uh, uh, in praising geometry uh, but not really beyond that and the reason is that the Greeks thought that well, that's all well enough. That is, that is this beautiful world, this beautiful, perfect world, but it has nothing to do with our, our, our real physical world. And in later century, the church agreed with that because uh, the perfect world might be appropriate for heaven, but we live in a fallen, corrupt world that, you know, that, that we can't really expect uh, uh, to be so uh, orderly, orderly and beautiful. That began to change only, uh, only really in the, in the Renaissance. It was in the Renaissance that this notion that geometry is not just something in the heavens, but is something that pervades our world is beginning to is beginning to take hold. And you see that in, in uh, most famously, or for example, uh, with the rediscovery of uh, of, uh, of uh, linear perspective. That is, if you look at look at this uh, uh, at this painting by Masaccio, for for example, you see there is there is a geometrical order that is printed imprinted into into this world, into the world, into the world that that it depicts. Uh, it is a perspectival order, all converging on a uh, on, uh, on on a single on a single point. Uh, so the the world is three-dimensional world that we live in is imbued and ordered and ordered by geometry. But the first to see the political implications or the social implications of that were the kings of France. Oh, by the way, here's another example that you see the emergence of uh, a geometrical, of the geometrical world. The right, so this is the same city of Florence. This is in about a hundred years apart. On the right side, you see the medieval view, this bundle of, of buildings one on top of the other, which actually conveys pretty well the feeling of walking those streets. On the left side, you see a geometrical view, a geometrical view of the city. Space is geometrical and every, every, every item has its own specific space, specific place in this geometrical place. So something, the world had become geometrical here. But the first to see the, uh, uh, the first to see the meaning and the use of uh, the use of geometry and its implication for, for uh, social and political order were the kings of France. Because the kings of France, beginning with Charles VIII at the, end of the, at the end of the 15th century, decided that they will try to establish their rule, not just on the fact that they have the biggest, the biggest armies and that they could defeat all their, uh, all their enemies, but on the claim but their rule was founded on the eternal, unchanging, unchanging uh, uh, principles of geometry. Because if they could claim, if a king can claim that their rule is founded on the principle of geometry, those eternal, unchanging rules, irrevocable, unchallengeable, permanent, whatever, yeah, on those rules, who can challenge them? Who can challenge? It's not just uh, their, 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 uh, their, their place in the world, their rule is part of the deep order of the universe itself. So they saw the value, the value, the enormous value and the enormous power of presenting themselves in precisely, in precisely that way. Uh, and first hesitantly, with, uh, but then with increasing confidence through the 16th and into the 17th century, right up to Louis XIV, uh, they imbued everything around them with the principles of geometry. The royal court was geometrically, was geometrically ordered. It was 
a, uh, it was a, a web of fixed, interconnected, interconnected relations in which hierarchical relations in which everyone had their had their permanent irrevoc irrevocable place. That is from the king at the top to the uh, 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 to the to the those of royal blood and the dukes and the counts and all, all of that hierarchy and life at court life at court became this great performance of order of precise hierarchical order uh, in which it was always a dance of of uh, it was always a dance of, of, of either either assertion if you're a, or, or, or deference. Uh, and it was, and everything, everything revolved around pro properly living in that particular place that was assigned to you in that unchanging permanent, permanent hierarchy of things. Uh, there was a dance, the dance of ballet, which was developed in the in, in the French court, was a refinement of those rituals, of those courtly rituals. And as you see, it was profoundly geometrical. It was all about. Uh, it was all about uh, uh, performing in those perfect geometrical, perfect geometric, geometrical patterns. Uh, it was, as you see, look, look at the move movements, that you look at the movements, look at the shapes that you see here. It was all about precise angles, precise lines, precise figures, all of them performed to geometrical, geometrical perfection. That was the dance of the French, of the French court, profoundly Profoundly geometrical, uh, geometrical dance. Uh, uh, there were uh, uh, there were uh, uh, treatises that were written uh, uh, for glorifying the king. That that is establishing the right of absolute monarchy. All of them modeled on the uh, on the uh, uh, on Euclid's on Euclid's element, uh, but nowhere. It was ge ge geometry was imbued everywhere. It was it was imbued into the into the French court, but nowhere, nowhere was that more so than in the gardens. Uh, it started with Charles VIII uh, first in in the Chateau d'Amboise in the Loire Valley, later on in the uh, in the Tuileries by uh, Catherine Catherine de, de Medici in Paris. Uh, and uh, everywhere, this was uh, uh, the notion of creating a geometrical garden was precisely creating a properly uh, a fixed, presenting a, a fixed world set in place by fixed, unchanging geometrical relations in which everything and everyone had their proper place. And as the style grew, it became clear that all of it also resided in the shadow of the palace. That is all this order and all this fixed fixed hierarchy of things was always aimed and was always always reached ultimately to the apex of the king. So geometrical gardens became a uh, became a royal uh, uh, prerogative. That is the rule of the kings of France was uh, uh, was was tied irre irrevocably tied to the possessions of those gardens. Even in the darkest days of the monarchy during the Civil War in the 16th century, when the authority of the king extended barely beyond the city, if to that, uh, if to that, they still expended enormous resources on building those gardens, creating those gardens, like the Tuileries in the 1570s, and performing geometrical dances, performances in those, in those gardens. And all of them, to reestablish that the rule of the King of France was founded on the deep geometrical order of the universe. And so when Louis XIV go to Volevicom, he sees a beautiful geometrical garden. It is clearly a magnificent geometrical garden. It is the best geometrical garden in, in all of France, no question about it, because it's not just the symmetries of the parterres that you see here, but you also see here this fundamental uh, this is basic. Uh, this fundamental uh, uh, perspective that you see in the uh, you see very clearly in this picture. The gardens of Olivicoma are, are perspectival, are like a perspectival painting. Uh, it's like, see, there you have it. Uh, all of it. There is a deep 
orderly geometry that pervades this that pervades this garden even beyond the simple symmetries of the parterres. It is the best. It is the most uh, magnificent geometrical garden in France, and all of it is in the shadow of the great lord of the garden, the one who the, 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 at the apex of all the lines, the apex of all lines of sight, the apex of all power, and that is Fouquet. Really? Fouquet. It's a commoner. That, of course, to a king like Louis XIV, that is absolutely, uh, uh, that, that, that is absolutely in, in, intolerable because Fouquet is presenting himself as a king. He is, he is presenting himself as the culmination of the eternal geometrical order of the universe. And he does it in this in this magnificent, uh, in this magnificent, magnificent garden. So it's not a, a matter of petty jealousy that uh, the king wants a, wants a pretty garden too. We can build that. It is that what Fouquet did is goes against the foundation of the monarchy. It goes, it, it, it is a direct attack on the foundation of the monarchy because it claims that that fundamental order that is the that the geometrical order that is the foundation of the rule of French kings is pointed not at the king, but at this minister, this lowly minister of finance. That is something, of course, that Louis cannot and will not tolerate, and that, that accounts for Fouquet's sad end. Um, so the king brings goes to Versailles, and in Versailles he creates he creates his own Vaux, and the similarities between Vaux and Versailles are are, are many and clear, and uh, they're uh, because the same people, same architect, the same team that designed uh, that designed uh, uh, um, Versailles has designed Vaux, and in particular it is of course the Notre who designed the gardens at Vaux, who now designed the gardens uh, the gardens at Versailles. And so Versailles, except that there, there is an order of magnitude difference between, uh, between the two, uh, because is, Versailles is vastly, vastly, vastly greater and larger uh, than, uh, 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 than Vaux. And the purpose is, of course, to make people completely forget about Vaux in the glory of the, in the, glory of the, uh, of the Sun King. Um, and uh, what you see here is, first of all, uh, there is the, the gardens of Versailles, as you see in, the, in this map from uh, 1700. The part, uh, the, the chateau, I'm not sure you can see my cursor here, but the chateau is right here about one quarter of the way up from the bottom, and then the gardens extend from there up to the, uh, up to the top. Uh, so the part closer to the chateau, that's a petit part. Uh, and that is a traditional, a traditional royal geometrical garden in the style of, say, the Tuileries, more elaborate, more beautiful, more, and, and so on. But fundamentally, that those, those separate parterres and, and bosquets there, all a perfectly ordered geomet geometrical world under the shadow of the uh, under the shadow uh, of the of the royal palace. Uh, but even more interesting is what happens beyond that. After the, that that that. Uh, 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 in the further part, the part of the upper half of this map, which is called the Grand Park, uh, and it is it is anchored on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the on the Grand on the Grand Canal, right in the middle that that uh, that uh, Le Notre uh, dug dug up there. That is a straight continuation of the of the central axis that is known as the Allée Royale. Going down from the king, from from the palace, from the center of the palace, and in fact the king's bedroom, right down, right down the middle of the Petit Park, and then down to the uh, to the Grand Canal. Now, when viewed from the palace, you look you look down at at, at the at the, at the uh, Grand Park, all you see is just the canopies of trees. But the message here is, if you look underneath the trees, you find a fixed geometrical order. That is, this is not a this is not chaos. There are those you see those 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 uh, straight lines, uh, uh, star shaped star shaped plazas, uh, geometrical patterns hidden secretly behind the canopy of trees, uh, which points out that even when it is unseen, there is a deep geometrical order in the world. And not only that, all of those lines, the central, the ones on the side, they form a great arrow and they point to one place. They point up to the center 
of the uh, Petit Park and through the Grand Allée of the Le Royal, sorry, and then up to the king, up to the palace and the king's bedroom. All lines, all lines of power, of sight, lead up. All, the, all this geometrical order is pointed up at the king. Okay, so this whole design is shows you that the rule of the king is the culmination of the hidden, of the hidden, sometimes hidden, sometimes not, but the geometrical order of the, uh, the geometrical order of the universe. Okay, sometimes it is hidden, but it is still there. There is a deep geometrical order, and all of it, all of it supports the rule of the great king of France. Okay, so I think we can see why somebody like uh, Louis XIV would like geometry in the way in the way he used geometry. But why should we care about geometry? Um, here you see that that central axis here, this beautiful central axis of Versailles. Um, well, it turns out that Versailles was quite influential. That is, it didn't end with Versailles. All the kings of Europe needed their own Versailles after all the kings and the emperors of Europe. So you had one in Spain and you had one in, in, in Vienna and you had one in St. Petersburg. And then the empires, the great European empires in the 19th century, they also adopted the same, uh, uh, the, the, the same pattern to establish their own rule to say that for a foreign, for a Europe, small European country like England to rule a vastly larger and wealthier continent, subcontinent like India was simply the natural order of things. So they created what you see here on the left, that is uh, what was, what the Rajpat is known now. So they built New Delhi, the new, the new capital, along, uh, uh, along lines of Versailles. Uh, the French, of course, did the same. You see their picture here from this is from Saigon here in the middle. On the right, there is Canberra. And then uh, also uh, Louis' rivals in Europe. So uh, there's uh, uh, Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna that you see on the right, and the Peterhof in, in, in St. Petersburg, and so on. So it, the idea was a powerful one, a, po a popular one in, in different contexts, that there is a deep geometrical order. And lo and behold, I am at the top of it, and there's nothing to do about it, because that is the order of the universe. A lot of people found use for that idea. Um, and still do. But the most creative and the most original of those, uh, of those uh, uh, patterns uh, of the uses of Versailles took place not in, a, uh, not in an empire and not in an autocracy, but in a republic. I'm talking, of course, about our own capital, um, Washington, Washington, D.C. And I think you can see here, you can see here very clearly that uh, uh, Washington DC is designed in large part as uh, as Versailles. You see the uh, the central uh, the central uh, uh, Allee Allee Royale. That for us is the uh, the, the is the uh, the National Mall that you see here. You see the converging the great boulevards converging on the center of power, the House of the People. Uh, capital, uh, capital Hill, which presides over, which presides over all, all this, all this, all this grand area. So clearly, uh, the design of the National Mall leading up to Capitol Hill is clearly an echo of Versailles, and that's no coincidence because the person who designed the city of Washington D.C. was not only a Frenchman, but the son of a royal painter who grew up in those royal gardens. He grew up in the Tuileries and in Versailles and so on. And that was the language that he knew. That was the design language that he was, that he was familiar with. And when he was, he sailed to America, fought in the war and was given the assignment to design the new federal capital after the passage of the constitution. That is what he brought. That is what he brought. He brought the echoes of Versailles. However, there's a difference. Right. There's a there's a there's a difference because Washington D.C. is a, is uh, the capital of a republic, not uh, is the capital of a republic, uh, not of a uh, not of a, a mon not not of a monarchy, and so L'Enfant used the language, the autocratic language of Versailles, to create a republican message. And how did he do that? He did it because. Capitol Hill is not the only, is not the only apex center of power, is not the only Versailles in Washington, D.C. There's also, of course, uh, 
what we call the White House, what uh, Lynch Fine in his design called the President's Palace, and he thought of it as much more, much grander than uh, uh, than the actual White House. As you see, uh, you, you see here, here you see the uh, you see it uh, looking from the South Lawn. Uh, you can see uh, as designed and what is the ellipse, and then the South Lawn leading up, leading up from uh, 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 from. Uh, uh, from the national, from the national mall, at a precise right angle, there is another Versailles there, right? With the president's palace presiding over this grand, over this great, over this great properly ordered world. So now you have two. Now you have two centers of power. Each of them, not just one, like you had at Versailles, but you have two of them, right? Um, you can. This is the map of Versailles. That, this is of uh, Infan. A map. Sorry, map of Washington D.C. as designed. Uh, I'm not sure you can see my cursor here, but here near this little point on the Potomac, this is the White. Uh, we know it's the President's Palace, White House. This is the Mall leading up to Capitol Capitol Hill. This is Pennsylvania Avenue connecting them. And so what you create, uh, Linfan created a right triangle of power. Because those two, those, those two centers of power, Congress on the one hand, the presidency on the other, each one of them is a great center of power, and so it has this great, uh, uh, this great uh, uh, sort of Versailles guard-like garden leading up to it. But also all the all the avenues, all, all the streets converge upon it from all from all direction, as actually it does at Versailles as well. Uh, they're all independently powerful, but they are locked in a geometrical stalemate. They are locked in a right triangle in which Pennsylvania Avenue is the hypotenuse and the mall and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the, then the, on the one side, and then what is now the ellipse and the South Lawn on the other are at a precise right angle. And, uh, and so they're not opposed to each other. They're at a, they're rectilinear to each other. They're both there. Neither one can do without the other. Neither one can operate without the other. Neither one can dominate can dominate the other. Two centers of power locked eternally in this in this dynamic tension. That is how Lin Fan, Lin Fan designed it. And that's not all. So those are the great centers of power. The, the centers of power of, of 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 Washington of the federal of the federal uh, of the federal government, but the city doesn't end there because spread throughout the city you see those other smaller uh, little um, little plazas there, each one a center in its own region of the city. Well, Linfan design Linfan's design each one of them was named after one of the fifteen states or fifteen states in the union at the time. Each one of them. Uh, uh, had its own had its own plaza, and each one of them dominates its immediate neighborhood and is also locked with each other to create this web that overlays the entire city and the entire federal government. Okay, so there is another source of power here. Okay, and it is also defined precisely. Geomet precisely and geometrically in this immovable geometrical web that overlays that overlays the entire city. So what Linfan accomplished using the language of geometry, he basically, he, what he accomplished, he, he recreated the constitution passed only two years before. He recreated the constitution on the city streets in stone and greenery and trees and plazas. He recreated it and he wrote it into the streets, into the design of Washington, D.C. Great balance of power, centers of power, centers of federal power interlock with each other on top of it, an interlocking geometrical web of state power and local power. And neither one is move, move, can move and ne neither one can, uh, uh, can be uh, uh, disentangled from from the other and he presented it as a geometrical order that is a fixed unchanging permanent order uh, i see i'm running out of time so i will just uh i did not get to my third uh, um my, my third theme here which was all about 
why the Western United States is gridded like this, just a single grid. Uh, I guess we don't, we will not get to that today, unfortunately. So let me say just uh, a few words about Washington, D.C., and, and then we can be on to hear some questions. Um, Versailles, you know, Louis XIV is long dead, as is Louis XVI. Uh, that's, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the old ab French absolutism is long gone. So we go to Versailles and we can appreciate its beauty, but we don't sense its power anymore. It's become a park, magnificent park, unique park, historical park, but, ju but just a park. But if you go to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is alive is alive as a center, as a capital of the republic, the greatest republic in the world. And I have to say, that message, that message of when you go and walk the streets, we'll go to the mall, walk on Sylvania Avenue, walk the streets of Washington, D.C., look up at the, at the uh, White House or, or Capitol Hill, the power of that order and the effect of that order is still there just as Lane Fan imagined, imagined it to be, just as Lane Fan imagined it to be. You look up at there, you look up at, at, at the White House or at Capitol Hill, and you say, there is something deep here. There is a deep order here. It is not easily moved. It is not, even, it is not easily toppled. It does not even depend on who is the exact resident of those houses. There is something deeper here, a deeper, a deeper order, and it is founded for Lane Fan on the eternal order of geometry. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. I hope uh, this was a way of looking at the world and seeing how mathematics orders it can order the world, how it's there, how it shapes our politics, how it shapes our way you look at the world. And I suggest it's a new way of looking at the world.